Good morning. My name is Brad. If you don't know me, I'm the campus pastor here. We're going to be in 2 Samuel 11 this morning, and I would invite you to turn there, grab your phone, whatever you want to do. Uh, we have Bibles underneath the seats around you if you did not bring one. It's quite a bit of text, and you might want to follow along, especially if you're a visual learner. Uh, as you're turning there, we're, we're continuing in our sermon series uh, for Advent called The Mothers of Jesus, which sounds progressive or new age, but it's not. So in Matthew 1, which we'll look at in a moment, there's a lineage of Christ. It's who he comes from. And it's abnormal that there's five women in this lineage. And you might say, well, that's kind of how things work. And it is. But back then, the genealogies, it wasn't often that women would be in there. It was fathers and sons. And so there's five women intentionally included in the line of Christ. And so we've been looking at them, these so-called mothers of Jesus, to see their, their stories. And see, why in the world are they in this genealogy? The, the Bible has no throwaway names, no throwaway verses. Everything is in it for a reason. And so we, we can look at these women and see God's redemption through them. We can see a couple of things. We can see who God came for by looking at the line of Christ. If you look at the line of Christ, it is not the who's who. It is not the reputable, upstanding people, but it is Jews and Gentiles, men and women, people of all different ethnicities, people who are absolutely messed up like us. And, and so the, the line of Christ is a messy thing, but when we see that, we see who he comes for. He claims the outcasts. He claims the sojourners. He claims those that are unclaimable, and that should be good news for you and me uh, because we're in that category. And what we see in these stories of these, these women, which are not stories, they're not fables, they're accounts of their lives. These things happened to these actual women. We see that hopelessness is not a final condition for the people of God. We see that in hopeless situations, God is working redemption. He's doing something. And so a bit of a disclaimer before we, we, we look at this text. This is an Old Testament text. And if you grew up in church, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. You might have grown up hearing these as moral fables. So we're talking about David and Bathsheba. And so you might say, well, well, don't be lazy like David. David should have gone out with his men to battle. We'll talk about that in a minute. Or trust God. Bathsheba seemed to trust God. And so there's like these moral exhortations. That's not what the Bible's about. After Jesus is resurrected, he's walking down the road with some of his disciples. They do not yet recognize him. And they're talking about all that's gone on. Jesus has been crucified and he's risen and everyone knows it. And so they're walking along and they're talking about this and they're like, can you believe this? Jesus is with them. They don't understand that it's him yet. But he begins to open their eyes and he begins to show them that the scriptures were fulfilled in him. That he is the one that knows what is going on around here. That he is the point of the scriptures. And so David and Bathsheba, as with other Old Testament narratives, are not moral fables, but there's Christ in these pages. There's redemption in these pages. And something for us in these pages. So in Matthew 1, verses 6 and 7, there's a little snapshot it says, and Jesse, the father of David, the king, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, and Abijah, the father of Asaph. Bathsheba is the wife of Uriah. And I used to work with a guy who called Lindsay, my wife. He, he always referred to her as my wife, and it, your wife. Like, what does your wife think about that? What does your wife think? Like, Man, she's got a name. Like, so why, why is Bathsheba's name not in here in the lineage of Christ? Is it dishonoring to Bathsheba? No. It's because there is a story here to tell. And Uriah has a part of that story. But this story, if you don't know it, or maybe if you do, it's a tragic story. 
It's not a clean, easy, you know, fable, if you will. It's a true story, and it's raw, and it's sad, and it's chaotic. And so you might look at a story like this and say, what good could come from a story like this? What good could come from tragedy, from murder, from abuse? Maybe your own life feels that way. Like, what good could come from my story? What could God have for me in this tragedy called life? Or maybe it's people around you that you love that are going through something, and you're like, what good could come from this? But God has a word to us this morning. He has a word for those of us, which would be all of us, who are sinners, who have fallen short of the glory of God. And for sufferers, those of us who have suffered at the hands of other people. So let's read our text, 2 Samuel 11. I'll provide a little bit of commentary as we go for context. In the spring of the year, the time when the kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. David has sent his troops to go fight the battle. David is a mighty king, a mighty warrior. He has slain thousands. He is legendary. But right now, he's hanging out at the house and he sends his boys. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I'm pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. Joab is the commander. Uriah works for him. He's like a Navy SEAL, a Green Beret. He's an elite warrior, a chosen one. David says, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. He's small talking as if something has not happened. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. What he's really saying is, go be with your wife. And Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, a man of integrity, said the ark in Israel and Judah dwell in booths. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink, and to lie with my wife. As you live, and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. And David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank, so that he made him drunk. So David is going with plan B. Let's see if we can get him drunk. See if he'll go to Bathsheba. And in the evening... He went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. Plan C now. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah at the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, 
and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. Skip down to verse 26. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Chapter 12. The Lord sent Nathan to David. Nathan is a prophet. He came to him and said to him, he's like, I'm going to tell you a story. There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought. And he brought it up, and he grew up with him and his children. He used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him, but he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this thing deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite by the, with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes, and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, But I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. This is the word of the Lord. There's a word here to sinners and sufferers. First to sinners. David has displeased the Lord. David must come under conviction, and at first he doesn't get it at all. And so he's shifting things around and he's trying to manipulate to get Uriah to come be with his wife so maybe that baby could be their baby. And so he's doing all this stuff and eventually he gets down this road to where he's like, I'm going to have to kill this guy to cover what I've done. Uriah, this loyal, elite soldier. Bathsheba, a woman who's simply bathing says he took her, had her brought to him, used his power to bring her. And what we see is that the thing that David has done displeased the Lord. God is not okay with David's sin. God is not okay with sin. And God is not okay with your sin or my sin. Sin is an offense to God. We covered Romans 118 the other day. It'll be on the screen. It says this. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. 
The wrath of God is the sustained righteous opposition of God towards sin. God is righteously angry at sin. It is offensive to him. It stinks to him. And it is not okay. And he is opposed to it. And a lot of people don't want to talk about the wrath of God anymore. But if you remove the wrath of God from the Bible, you remove the Bible. God is righteously opposed to sin. And so someone has to pay. If you came to my house, we have a lot of lamps because we do indirect lighting because like overhead lighting feels like interrogation, so it's more warm and inviting. If you came to my house, we have lamps. If you tripped and knocked one of my lamps over, no big deal. It's just a lamp. We probably bought it at Home Goods for $15 or something. But if I were to say, don't worry about it, I'll, I'll, I'll replace the lamp. It's all good. I would pay for the lamp, right? I would pay for what is broken. If you said, no, 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 I, I want to replace the lamp. I, it's, I want to. It's, it's only right that I do that. Okay, then you pay for the lamp. If nobody replaces the lamp, then then I pay for the lamp because the room is darker and I don't have a lamp anymore. But the thing is, someone must pay. And how much more so for sin? Sin must be paid for. Justice must occur. God is a just God. And so justice is crucial And so there's this theological reality called propitiation. Say that with me, propitiation. It means to satisfy. It means to satisfy the wrath of God. And that is what Jesus did on the cross. So when we consider Advent, why Jesus came, he came to satisfy the righteous wrath of God towards sin and towards sinners. And so he takes on the wrath of God. Propitiation. Pro means for. So Jesus proactively satisfies the wrath of God. And therefore, Romans 8.1 can be true of you if you're a Christ follower, which says there's therefore Now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. There is no wrath coming your way if you're in Christ because he has taken it. If we double click on this idea in Romans 3, it says, for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're in this category and so am I. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. David has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so have we. And we're justified by his grace as a gift. You didn't save yourself. You didn't justify yourself. It is a gift from God through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. The payment must be made to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God is just He's a God of justice, of making wrongs right. There must be a payment. God is the justifier, the one who who justifies and, and puts us right before himself through the work of Christ, only through Jesus coming, living a perfectly righteous life and dying a sacrificial substitutionary death for you and me and raising from the grave, conquering death, Can God be both just, a payment must be made, and merciful, granting grace through the payment of Christ? 
And so propitiation means that the wrath of God is satisfied, that God is both the just and the justifier. And God does not just declare his people innocent and leave them alone. He doesn't say, you're you're exonerated, you're free, now get out of my courtroom. We go from being an enemy to, to family. Sons, daughters, heirs, beloved, cherished by God. His disposition is completely changed by the propitiation of Christ. And so some of you, some of us in here have secrets, have a past, And you look around and you think that, 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 that one of these things is not like the others. These people aren't like me. They don't know what I've done. They don't know what I'm doing. They don't know my secrets. These must be the good people and I'm just one of the messed up people. Those of us under the weight of conviction. Maybe you think you're the only one in here. God has a word for you. Number one, you're not the only one. If you think that the church is the morally upstanding people who have it all figured out, you have that wrong. By God's grace, yes, the the family of God should be growing in Christ's likeness, but this is a room full of needy people. Of people who need the propitiation of Christ, who need the wrath of God satisfied for them. So I don't know what you're dragging with you. But the work on the cross is complete. And you can reach back into history by the power of the Holy Spirit and apply that propitiation, that satisfaction, that change of disposition of God to your soul right now. That it is finished can mean it is finished for you. It says in chapter 12, verse 13, Nathan says to David, he says, the Lord has put away your sin. That can be true of you. The Lord has put away your sin. It's not provisional propitiation, like like it's, it's been satisfied, but you better keep it together. or it's been satisfied unless you do that one thing, it is paid in full, it is finished through Christ. The Lord has put away your sin. But a payment must be made. That child that Bathsheba is pregnant with pays the penalty for David, for his propitiation. A price must be paid. Jesus is that payment for you. So there's a word to sinners, run to Christ, where the wrath of God can be satisfied for your sin. The things that you have done, that I have done, have displeased the Lord through Christ. He is pleased with you. But there's also a word to sufferers here. You have Bathsheba, A lot goes down in verse 4. Look at it. David sends messengers. He's the king. He's the man. He sends messengers to Bathsheba, to this woman who he was creepily watching while she was cleaning herself. And he took her and he lay with her. And then look at that last line. Then she returned to her house. What was that like for her? What was she thinking as she walked back to her house after that moment? Did she feel shame? Did she feel dirty? Did she feel unclean? Did she have anxiety and fear? What did she feel? You 
See, shame makes us live a life in the shadows where we hide, where we isolate, where we separate ourselves from other people, even if we're around them. And so we try to explain what has happened. We're always telling ourselves a story. You're a storyteller. You're telling yourself a story about what's going on in your life. You're telling yourself a story about what you've done. You're telling yourself a story about what's been done to you. So you can walk in that shadow and you can explain it away. You can try to numb it with alcohol or other sins or entertainment. But isolation perpetuates the pain. We need outside help. Positive self-talk is not enough. There's a book called Rid of My Disgrace written by Justin and Lindsay Holcomb. They say this in this book. It says, What victims need are not self-produced positive statements, but God's statements about his response to their pain. How can you be rid of these dysfunctional emotions and their effects? How can you be rid of your disgrace? God's grace to you dismantles the beliefs that give disgrace life. Grace recreates what violence destroyed. So there's a theological reality for the sufferer called expiation. Say that with me. Expiation. Ex means from. It means the removal of the stain, the pollution, the filth of sin, whether you've done it or it's been done to you or both. So Jesus takes that upon himself. You see, David and Bathsheba would have been familiar with the sacrificial system under the old covenant. Animals had to be sacrificed to atone for sin because a price must be paid. So they would take two goats. The one would be killed as a sin offering, a payment. The other one, the priest, would put his hands on their head and impart the sins of the people onto this goat, and he would send that goat out east, out away from the people, sending their sins away. Jesus is that scapegoat. Jesus is the one who had our sins imparted onto him that he bore, that he paid for, and he takes it from you. including the shame, including the guilt. In 1 John 1, 7, it says if we walk in the light as he's in the light, Jesus is in the light, he is the light. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in the light and expose the truth, of our sin and our suffering to the light of Christ. We can illuminate what has been done because we are safe with Jesus. And we have fellowship with one another. What better place to heal than with other people who are healing and who can remind you of what is true, of who you are, We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Do you know that the blood of Jesus washes your soul? At the deepest part of you, the place where your emotions come from, the place where your thoughts come from, the place where your affections come from, the place where your motivations come from, where all your decisions come from. The source of the source of the source of you. The blood of Christ washes you clean there. The expiation of Christ removes the dirt from there. In Hebrews 12, we see what Jesus did. He says that that we look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. He is the one who has done it. 
who for the joy that was set before him, why could he be joyful? He's redeeming God's people. He endured the cross and he despises the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. God is not okay with sin and he is not okay with shame. Jesus scorns the shame and it's imputed to him. He takes it on. You see, at the center of the Christian faith is a bloody and broken, humiliated man who takes on the sins and the shame of the world. And by his blood, we can be cleansed. Jeremiah says this. He says, heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me and I shall be saved for you are my praise. Look at that guarantee. Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. There is healing that is possible. We ask God to heal us, and he is faithful to do that through the cleansing blood of Christ. Heal me, and I shall be healed. Jesus illuminates the darkness, and he cleanses our soul with his light and with his truth. He counteracts the lies. What Jesus says is, is you're not filthy. You're not dirty. You're not unclean. You're not unworthy. Through me, you are mine. Come in. Let your shame be turned into praise. I read that this morning in Zephaniah 3. That our shame can be turned into praise. So what good could come from a story like this? A story of grievous sin, of deception, of murder, of abuse, of walking in shame, Well, it's not just their circumstances that change. I think sometimes we're like, we think redemption is that life gets better. You know, for David, it did. He was the king. He died a good old age, honored. It was was pretty good for David. Bathsheba, it got a little better. I mean, she, she eventually bore Solomon the king, so she's the mother of the king. That didn't mean anything in the grand scheme of things. If you think redemption is just circumstantial, you're aiming too low. Through these people and through this awful story comes Jesus, the one who would redeem the sinner, the one who would redeem the sufferer. And so there's a much bigger story than David and Bathsheba and Uriah that they get to live in. That through them, Christ comes. Through them, the one who offers propitiation comes, satisfaction of the wrath of God. The one through whom expiation comes, a removal of the pollution of sin. And so I don't know your story. I don't know if you wonder what good could come from it. But I hope that you see that you're caught up in a much bigger story of redemption which can be personally applied to you in this moment. Father, we thank you for the work of Christ that you sent your son that a payment must be made And that Jesus, you say, I'll pay it. It is finished. May the theological realities not be heady ideas, but but heartfelt truths of propitiation that Jesus 
you satisfy the righteous wrath of God by taking our sin on, though you knew no sin, so that in you we might become the righteousness of God. That Jesus, through your blood, we can be cleansed from what we've done and what has been done to us. That your grace recreates what violence destroyed. You are worthy of all praise and all honor in every song. As we begin to sing, Holy Spirit, would you apply this word to us very specifically that our shame would turn into praise and our guilt into liberation. We have every reason to sing. So help us do that, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.